There's one clear winner as a result of the Noel V. Marte suspension. We'll tell you why it's Jonathan India on today's Locked on Reds. You are Locked on Reds, your daily Cincinnati Reds podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked on Reds with myself, Jeff Carr, and my co-host, Stephen Offenbaker. We are a lifelong Cincinnati Reds fans that have turned an addiction to this team and to information for you. I want to thank you for taking time out of your day to listen to us talk some Reds with you. I encourage you, if this is your first time, hit us up on Twitter if you're listening on your favorite podcasting app or jump down in the comment section here on YouTube and just let us know any old thing. Comments are good. Questions are great. Takes are better. All of the great stuff down in the comments section there. We are Locked On Reds, of course, and we are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every single day. And we are coming to you here. We did a live show uh, last night, Sunday night, reacting to the Frankie Montas announcement. If you're looking for opening day starter stuff, we've got another episode about that. Make sure you check that out. On this episode, though, we are going to talk about why Jonathan India has a new lease on life when it comes to Major League Baseball with the unfortunate suspension of Noel V. Marte. We're also going to look at the declaration that David Bell made that basically Ellie is batting second, so just get ready for it. And did they make the right call on that? Plus, we will then get into, I've got a thought, like, did the Reds know? Did, did, did they have, like, foresight about the Marte suspension? Uh, because I have a few questions about that that we'll get into later on in today's episode. Before we get into all of that, I want to let you know that today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. New customers, join today, and you'll get $150 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. And Steve, where we will get started today is with Jonathan India, who I believe... As much as anybody can benefit, and I hate the fact that I'm using the word benefit off of somebody else's plight, but as much as anybody benefited from Noel Marte missing 80 games this season, uh, this is going to give India a long time to prove that he can fit into this Ben Zobris role that the Reds are carving out for him. Yeah, in, in a blink of an eye and a snap of a finger, he went from an afterthought from a guy that they were going to have to work to get playing time for, from a guy that they were going to have to shoehorn in wherever they could. He went from being that guy to being an integral part of this Reds lineup for at least the first 80 games. Uh, gone is the, oh, what are we going to do? And now is, hey, Jonathan, you're going to be playing a lot of second base. You're going to be playing a lot of first base. You're going to get maybe an occasional look at third base. You're going to get a look at left field. You are going to be the guy. You're going to be out there almost every day. Uh, that is a big difference from what his day looked like, let's just say, even a week ago. Uh, so now the question is, is he going to be able to rise to the occasion? Is he going to be able to deliver that Ben Zobris type, playing those multiple positions while not having some kind of fall off offensively? Because really, at the end of the day, that's what it's about. You want to find ways to keep Jonathan India's bat in your lineup. You want a good Jonathan India to be able to provide rest to everybody else while not having tons of fall off in any one position when you make that swap. Yeah, it was kind of good to see the fact that he got to play two of the last three games. We saw him at first base on Friday, saw him at left field on Sunday. He wasn't really tested in left field defensively, but we saw him hit a leadoff home run in the bottom of the first inning. That was fan that was fantastic to see. It's something that we saw quite a bit with him playing second base. So gives me a little bit of hope that nothing will change at the plate. And that's the key here is that they're able to move him around and hitter Jonathan India stays the same. And, and you just get something from him defensively. He's a guy that over the last few years, it's become very apparent is a below average to maybe even not so great defender at second base. He makes plays here and there, but he also makes some boneheaded errors here and there as well. So if you can mitigate that by placing him in left field or DH or whatever, but you keep that bat in the lineup, that's where the value is going to come. And, and with the Marte suspension, I think that this opens up a lot of playing time 
at the DH spot simply because some of the guys that were going to get more DH playing time are now going to be required to play some third base. Like Candelario, I think was going to get a decent amount of DH playing time as was CES. Now you basically see those dudes being the key corner infielders. Like Candelario is going to play third base mostly. CES is going to play first base mostly. So then DH kind of helps out guys like Fraley, you know, Benson can take some, some time at the DH spot now. Uh, but definitely Jonathan India being able to play DH a lot more. I, I think it's the clear, he is the clear winner of this and we're going to see more of him. Yeah. You know, if we're talking about this realistic with 80 game suspension for Novi Marte, that's about 200 at bats that are now going to be redistributed to the rest of the team. And the lion's share of those 200 bats are going to go to Jonathan India. Uh, you know, we talk about his defense, Jeff, and, and to his credit, he made a nifty little play at first base when he was in the game, his first game back, a diving little diving stop. Nice. Yeah, made a catch. Um, and being a second baseman, third baseman, being an infielder, I think that's the advantage of him playing at first. He's going to be able to field that position well. Um, once he gets the footwork down, I, I'm, I'm not trying to say first base is easy. Um, you've got to get that footwork down to be able to get back to the bag, find the bag, you know, pick off plays, things like that. But as far as just fielding the position, you know, hitter hits the ball, you catch the ball, Jonathan India being a third baseman, second baseman infielder type helps him over there at first base. So defensively there, I think he's going to be fine. Uh, left field, I'm going to need to see more. I'm going to need to see him run routes. I'm going to need to see him have to throw a ball and try and get a guy out. I need to see what that looks like. I need to I need to see if Ellie has to sprint halfway into left field to be the cutoff man. We're going to need to know that. That, that but, was you know, kind of the annoying thing about that not being to, on TV, too. Yeah, I hate that. It gives him it gives it gives Jonathan India uh tons of opportunity now to really you know we talked about this season was going to be uh, a, a season where he was fighting for his professional life so to speak um he was going to have to find a way to create value and and somebody else did that for him somebody else gave him the opportunity now it's a question of is he going to be able to seize a hold of it and i find this interesting because he hit lead off he had a lead off home run there I wonder, and, and David Bell has said, and we're going to talk about his comments about the, the lineups that you've seen in spring training and stuff like that. He has basically said that outside of Ellie De La Cruz, don't read too much into the lineup. But I almost wonder if against left-handed pitching, if India's in the ball game, whether it be at DH or first base or left field, wherever it is, are we going to see him hit leadoff? Because he has shown in the past he's pretty good at that. Yeah, and we'll, we'll dig into uh, the lineup a little bit more in the next segment, but I think you're right. It's a good question because if it's not going to be Friedel against lefties, and they did that a lot last year, and Friedel did just fine, but if you're not going to bat Friedel there against a left-handed pitcher or an off day for Friedel, you really have two choices, and that's Matt McClain or Jonathan India. Uh, Jonathan India has done it before. He's at times done it well. So seeing him you know, with a little leadoff pop, uh, the ability to – to have one at bat and have a lead already with a guy that can, uh, can drive the ball over the fence from time to time. I like that. I, I, I think that what Nick crawl has created with this depth and, and everybody questioning what Nick crawl was doing and why sign Candelario and why do all of these things? Well, this is why you never know what's going to come at you. And, and then we're going to have some, uh, real conversation a little bit later about what the reds knew and when they knew it. Uh, but for me, I think that Nick Craw has done a tremendous job of building the depth to mitigate the things that have gotten the Reds in trouble their last several successful seasons. That was guys getting tired. That was injuries near the end, leaving them with little options to recover from it, to be able yep. to push forward. Nick Craw took care of both of those things with the roster that he has built. And, and Jonathan India, the luxury that Jonathan India was. And we kept wondering, why aren't they trading him? Why, what are they doing? Why is, why is he still around? Well, Nick crawl had a vision for Jonathan India. And I think that this was the vision and, and you, you've labeled it the Ben Zoberus type. Um, and I think that is a perfect way to describe the role that I think Nick crawl wants for Jonathan India this year and maybe beyond. Yeah. It's the, it's the super utility Wherever we need you to play, if somebody needs a day off or if, if we just need you in the lineup and we aren't necessarily sure of who's going to be in and who's going to be out, we know you can play multiple positions. 
he now has plenty of time to prove that he is the man for that. Well, listen, Jeff, speaking of guys that are going to be the man, Ellie De La Cruz has been given a pretty definitive spot in the batting order, and we're not even to opening day. Is that a premature decision? Well, we're going to tell you coming up. Before we get to that, I want to shout out the sponsor of today's podcast. Today's episode is brought to you in part by FanDuel. Get buckets on your first bet with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets back with any winning $5 or more bet. That's $150 if your bet wins. You can bet on all of your favorite NBA action right now uh, while you're waiting for opening day to get here. Uh, you can do quick bets. You can do same game live parlays. You can do exclusive props. So much more. They've got over-unders over there. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and shoot your shot. If you're looking for some baseball odds, well, Hunter Green has 42 to 1 odds to win the Cy Young. Uh, not sure about the odds for opening day starter. Ace of the staff, Frankie Montas. If you want to hear more about that, jump over to our episode we recorded earlier. It's in your feed already. Head to FanDuel to get in on the Hunter Green action. 42 to 1 for Cy Young. That could be interesting. FanDuel is an official sports book partner of the NBA and it's the official sports book of Locked On. Speaking of Locked On, Locked On has launched the first ever national 24 7 streaming sports channel on YouTube. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with local experts like Jeff and I, plus Locked On's national shows covering each and every league. Just go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. Coming up on our next episode, should the Cincinnati Reds go and get an outfielder? One of us, at least one of us, says that they should. You're not going to want to miss that conversation. That's going to be on tomorrow's show. But today we're going to talk batting order. We're going to talk lineups because David Bell said something very interesting um, in a day that David Bell said a lot of surprising things yesterday, uh, yeah. named the opening day starter. Not a guy that any of us predicted. Again, get back in your feed if you want to hear us talk about Frankie Montas and react to that. But he also said that Ellie De La Cruz hit number two. A little bit of surprise. I think that, Jeff, you envisioned Ellie De La Cruz starting a little bit lower. When I put out my way too early opening day lineup, I had Ellie waffling back and forth between third and sixth. Neither one of us had him hitting second. No, and I, I think that he's got the ability to do that, but I think that we both agreed that he's got some things to prove to get to that point. And it's almost as if the Reds are saying, no, 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 no. He's already done that. He's already proved it. We're good. He's going to be there. And David Bell basically, I mean, David Bell literally came out and said, Ellie batting second, Ellie has been batting second all spring. You can read into that. I think that's where he's hitting. The rest of my lineup, you can kind of just, you know, whatever. It's interchangeable parts, guys getting at bats, what are and whatnot. But Ellie, you can pay attention to. And I feel like this is the Reds once again asking us to trust that they know what they're doing and they're doing the right thing they're, they're, they're trusting they're, they're, they're asking that of us by, by naming Frankie Montas, the opening day starter. And they're asking us to trust them that yes, we know Ellie has proved it and he's ready to go because this is kind of an interesting thing. And this is why I love spring training, David Bell, because Regular season, David Bell is, uh, you know, we, we did a really good, you know, go out and compete. And we did a really, really good job of, did a really good job of that. Spring training, David Bell's candid and says like normal things that are very insightful and lets you know what he's thinking about the game of baseball. So, you know, we've got, you know, 17 more days to hear David Bell say things that matter in post game interviews. But it's interesting that it was so, and this was all Sunday. Sunday, he was like, opening day starter. I picked it. Ellie's batting second. We know that he said early in camp ellie's the shortstop matt mcclain's the second baseman he is just out here he's got a plan man but do we trust this because ellie batting second if you if you if you kind of hash out the lineup like steve is about to it makes this lineup really exciting this lineup could be really exciting and uh, let's get through this lineup jeff and then i'm gonna tell you why i have a bit of a different take on what they're doing with ellie and how it, it compares to what they're doing have done with hunter green 
Uh, but before we get to that, let's let's look at what a potential Reds opening day lineup could be because we, we think they're going to face a right-handed pitcher on opening day. We don't know for sure, but we think that's how it's going to pan out. So if, uh, if David gives me a call and lets me set the lineup, this is the way I'm going with it. I'm batting TJ Friedel leadoff, and I'm putting him in center field. Uh, we know that Ellie De La Cruz will be next, and we know that he'll play shortstop. David Bell has told us both of those things. Uh, batting third, then, I would go with Matt McClain playing second base. Mm. Uh, in the cleanup spot for power, do we go Candelario? Do we go CES? For me, I'm going CES. I want to put him in that four hole. I want him to be the cleanup hitter. I want him to be the cleanup hitter all He's been year good. long. I put him there. I have him play first base. Then I go Candelario. I have him play third base now. Whereas before I was thinking of him more as a DH more often than not, but I think now he's going to be the everyday third baseman more often than not. So batting fifth, Candelario playing third base. That means sixth, sixth, Spencer steer playing left field. We're at six already. And that's when we get to Spencer steer, follow him up again, right-handed pitcher on the mound. I am assuming. So batting seventh at the designated hitter spot. I'm going with Jake Fraley here. Uh, seventh. I follow that by going Tyler Stevenson at catcher because I want to keep the best number nine hitter in baseball batting number nine. And I go at number nine, Will Benson playing right field. I love this lineup. And I, and I think too, like David Bell has said this much, it's going to change quite a bit. This is not going to be the everyday lineup against right-handers, but this shows the potential of that lineup. I really feel like, we are going to see lots of different iterations, but like I, I challenge you, I challenge you or anybody else in the comment section, find the hole in this lineup. Right. Like right. where in this lineup, where in this lineup, if you're coming out between innings, say, let's say CES made the last out and you're coming back with Candelario steer Fraley. Where's the hole? Where's the like, Oh man, they're giving away free outs. If Fraley makes the last out, you've got Stevenson Benson Friedel coming out in the next mm -hmm. inning. Where's the hole? There's no hole. There's for years we have dealt with, oh God, seven, eight, nine. That's going to be a one, two, three inning. None of that <laughs> exists in this lineup. Right. Here comes Kevin Newman, Aristides Aquino, and, and Nick Senzel. Um, no, I, I really think that this lineup is so deep, and it starts with just the on base potential of the top three guys. I mean, Friedel, Ellie, and Matt McClain are just so dangerous. And I mean, TJ, like you always wonder a little bit about guys that get on base in front of Ellie. Are they going to stop him? Are they going to block him? They've been doing double steals with TJ Friedel all spring. Like mm -hmm. TJ Friedel stole home the other day on a double steal. And I, I don't think that that is just, Hey, we're, you know, we're going happy, go lucky in spring training mode. No, this is what they're going to do. They're going to be aggressive all season long. And I absolutely love the idea of those guys up at the top and then even if you if you do switch it around for like lefties and you put india at the top then you could go india ellie you know matt mcclain and you could almost reset the lineup at six have tj friedel bat sixth and then you've got like this bottom half of the lineup that is still it just starts over this whole new thing i i feel like there's so much talent within this lineup especially with ellie at sec you know batting second if he hits that 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 potential that we all know that he has and i think that this is kind of the interesting thing to me because the potential is unlimited he can literally hit anywhere in the lineup i feel like the reds are celebrating what he is going to do whereas with what they did with hunter they're challenging him to get there they're challenging him to get to that spot they were kind of already saying that ellie's gotten there I'm going to disagree with you and shocking, right? Um, for me, <laughs> I think they're handling Ellie De La Cruz the exact same way that they handled Hunter Green. Remember that Hunter Green's a year ahead of Ellie De La Cruz. Uh, when Hunter Green came up, they, they put him out there. They let him do his rookie things. They gave him opportunities to grow. Uh, he rose to the occasion on many occasions. And then they came back in year two. And the narrative and the actions of the Reds were... We believe in you. You are going to be our ace. We're putting you in this rotation. You go do your thing. We're making you uh, face of the franchise. You're going to be an opening day guy for us. You're going to be the man. That's year two. Go out there. Become great. Year three, Hunter Green didn't necessarily become great.
still hasn't added those pitches, still hasn't become the dominant ace that everybody thought he was going to be. No one's giving up on him. But as I said in our Frankie Montas episode, they're firing a shot to cross the bow right now and telling him, all right, buddy, it's time for you to work a little harder and get this done. This it's, is year two. Yeah. This is year two for Ellie. So now he's been out there. He's had his rookie season. He's had to go out there, be a rookie, figure it out, learn the game, get comfortable. All right, Ellie, it's year two. You're our number two hitter. You go out there and you become the MVP that we think you can be. You be that guy. So it's the same plan. It's the same mode of operation. If we get to next year and Ellie still hasn't turned the corner, well, then maybe it's, hey, bro, you're batting eighth, and I don't know if you're even going to start every day. You need to you need to earn it. That would be consistent. So for me, they're in two different places, but I like what they're doing because they're telling Ellie they believe in him. Now go get it. Go be that guy. Go steal 40 bases. Go hit 20 home runs. Go disrupt. That's why I think they're saying. If, if if Ellie, you can mark this down. I don't even think it's a bold prediction. If, if Ellie bats second all year, he's still in like 50, 60. Easy. He's mm -hmm. going to hit the over. I mean, because I was thinking, and I think that it was baked into his over under a 40 and a half is that some people probably thought he was going to hit lower in the order. Hitting second. And if he beats the challenges like he has done so all throughout his minor league career, if he rises above this next thing, understanding, you know, pitch recognition and stuff like that. He, he's going to hit that six war plateau that I was, that I was saying he could Ooh, do. Like at least one of us still has a prediction alive. <laughs> yeah. What well, the Marte thing I had. Well, I had well that and Mookie, else. Betts, I had Mookie Betts is playing shortstop, Jeff. I can't even, I, the Dodgers, <laughs> we're, we're the wrong. Dodgers screwed me again. <laughs> we're already wrong on that, but Hey, I know this. Ellie's got the talent to hit anywhere in the order. And I, I don't necessarily think it's too early to put him at the top, but it's definitely the reds. Once again, asking us to trust that they know what they're doing. Speaking of trusting that the reds know stuff. When the Noel V. Marte suspension was announced, my first thought was, did the reds have a premonition about this? I'll explain why coming up next. Before we get into that, though, I want to tell you about another one of today's sponsors, and that is Amazon Fire TV. Because when we look at Amazon, hang on. Before we jump into that, I want to tell you about another one of today's sponsors, and that is Amazon Fire TV. You know, Fire TV is your destination for sports, from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis. Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs, as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing television that provides access to millions of movies and TV episodes, as well as free and live TV. Whether it's opening weekend for baseball or the college basketball tournament, you're going to want to have a Fire TV. Fire TV recently created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands, all for free. That includes all of us here at Locked On and most of the big pro leagues and conference tournament or college conferences as well. Fire TV channels lets you dive into all the games and analysis, highlights, and more to keep up to date on all the latest in the world of sports with March Madness coming up, the NBA going to the stretch run, Major League Baseball getting started, and lots more. Not to mention great news, entertainment, gaming, travel, cooking videos. I love cooking videos. I watch cooking videos all the time. Uh, that's like half my TikTok, and it's half my Fire TV channels as well. So check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. If you haven't checked out Fire TV channels, you should. Trust me on this. To learn more, visit www.amazon.com slash locked on Fire TV. In between episodes, you can follow us on Twitter, on X. You can follow me at Jeff Carr with three Fs. You can follow Steve at us, Offenbaker, with two Fs. You can follow the show at Lockdown Reds. There's no Fs in that. Also, join the Lockdown Reds Discord page. A lot of great folks talking Reds baseball. Got a link to the Discord page in the description of today's episode. Just check that out. Also, bookmark insidethereds.com. Got you covered in the written form as well. Caleb Sisk writing a ton of great stuff about spring training baseball out there. Uh, I've got takes. Steve's got takes. Uh, James Rapine's writing there. Ricky Chino, Austin Elmore. A lot of great folks covering the Reds. 
at InsideTheReds.com. Bookmark it today. All right, Steve, I, I missed this because I was out of town. Uh, but the Marte suspension, 80 games, PEDs, bold and own. I, I think you did a fantastic job of really laying it all out. And, and, and I don't have much to add. I agree with you. I'm, I'm like, dude, like whether you knew or you didn't know, it's a bad look. I just, I don't get it. But looking at it from this point of view, because I think my first thought was, did the Reds have some sort of premonition when they signed Candelario? And the more that I've gotten to think about this, because I didn't get the chance to talk with you on Friday, I don't think so. And there's a couple of reasons as to why the plan for Candelario was not in case somebody gets hurt. Candelario was going to play mostly every day. The idea with that was what they've been telling us all off season and all spring training is that they want guys to have regular rest and be fresh all season long. And the way that you do that is you have a talented roster that, all right, if Marte's playing third, great. If Candelario's playing third, great. You, you, you don't feel like you're missing anything by starting one or the other. So I think that that is an important thing to note. Was that something like, cause I, I know that was my initial tweet whenever it all happened. What was your take on that? Cause I, I just didn't. Yeah. 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 I never really questioned whether or not the front office knew something uh, specifically for, for Candelario. No, they, that had nothing to do. One does not have anything to do with the other. Uh, you just said that very well. They went out and signed Jamer because they are trying to make a better team, a better lineup. And a guy that was a switch hitter with no drop off, you know, his splits are pretty equal. That's an everyday guy, no matter who's pitching. That's why they signed him. Uh, this, this, the suspension, I think caught the reds off guard um, because they were, they were building and, and, practicing and moving towards implementing that plan that Nick Craw and David Bell told us about. And Noel V. Marte was a big part of that plan. Uh, yeah. A rookie of the year type campaign from Noel V. Marte was a big part of that plan. So while they did have the insurance, we talked about this a little earlier today that they had the insurance in Jonathan India, Jonathan India was going to have to really fight for at bats that was never part of the plan. The plan was for Jonathan India to get the scraps. And now the plan has been changed and derailed. Jonathan is going to have to be an important part of this thing. He's going to have to fill that role. They envisioned for Noel V. Marte. They had no clue this was coming. India insurance company. We keep your baseball teams covered. Uh, yeah. And I also think too, that the, the waving of Jose Barrero also kind of proves that threads didn't have any foresight of this. Like, I think also too, like if you are questioning, and I, I had this thought immediately after tweeting it, if you're questioning whether or not the Reds knew the suspension was coming down the pipe, then you're asking a lot of other stuff that I don't think jives with the, what the Reds have done this entire off season. They have had a plan from the word go. They know what's going on. And with, and I want to, I, yeah. I want to shout out David Bell, who clearly listened to my live show. <laughs> because less than yeah. less than 24 hours after my live show where I yeah. said what Jose Barrero needs is a change of scenery. He's not going to make this team. They should be done with him. Jose Barrero is a Texas Ranger. So yeah. um, that was exactly how that was going to go. Um, and whether they did it this week or the final week, it was still going to play out the way that it was going to play out. Which that announcement came and, and it like hit my phone while I was standing just minutes away from Globe Life Field there in Arlington. So I don't know if I had anything to do with him going to Texas or not, but embrace debate there. I, I think it's interesting because, yeah, like Jose Barrero was never going to be an insurance policy for infielders. Like he was going to play in the outfield if the Reds thought he was going to work out at all. And the fact that he was waived early, I've seen some folks asking this question, why you wave him now and not wait? until March 27th or whatever, because the reds really felt like there was nothing more he was going to give to this team. There was well, nothing those, more that he could provide. There's only a few, there's a limited number of at bats available in spring. And if you already know that this is not your guy, if you already know that you want to see more of those guys, you don't waste those precious commodity at bats hurting other guys yeah. on a yeah. guy that you're going to use. And for Jose Barrero, this was the, the fair right thing to do. Get it done early. Yeah. Get him to another team. See if he can do something for them. See if there's somebody over there that with a fresh set of eyes sees something and can fix Jose Barrero. Want nothing but the best for Jose Barrero. I hope he goes to Texas and competes well and plays well for a long time. Uh, no ill will for him. But 
But this was absolutely the right move. The, the Reds need yeah. to figure out now who the 26th man is going to be because we were we were wondering, is it going to be Stu Fairchild? Is it going to be somebody else? Well, obviously, whoever that guy, battle. they're moving up one already. There's a new yeah. battle for 26th man. So they, and they've only got a few weeks to figure it out. Yeah, and I, I think we're going to talk more about should they add somebody to that list. That'll be on tomorrow's episode. But I do also want to close with this. I, I thought briefly about it. But to be honest, it was a moot point because he had signed as a non-roster invite with the Blue Jays, and that is could Joey Votto have been an option had he been available after the suspension? And I still go back on no because the way that he has played these last few years, it just doesn't jive with what the Reds were going to be. If, if the Reds brought him back, it would be a distraction. As, as much as I hate to say it, I love Joey Votto. But the point of having Joey Votto on your team at this point in his career, I, I don't necessarily think would have worked with what this team is trying to accomplish. I don't think it would have been a, a distraction, Jeff, but I don't think that the, the team need right now is not what Joey Votto brings because you would be putting Joey Votto in that role that Jonathan India held up until the Noel V. Marte suspension, where you were going to have to fight and work and shoehorn to get him into games, get him at bats, get him spots, while still getting everybody else action as well. Uh, if the Reds are going to add at this point, and we'll, we'll probably jump into this on tomorrow's episode, it's got to be a right-handed outfielder bat. That's, it, that's just it. I agree with that. And I think... That's where we're going to end because we have a lot to say about that on the next Locked On Reds podcast. But thanks so much for checking out today's Locked On Reds. Like I mentioned earlier, if you have not checked out the Frankie Montas episode, we broke down our thoughts on Frankie Montas being announced as the opening day started. Go check that out. Make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss the next episode when we talk about whether the Reds should go get that right-handed outfield bat. And... We're going to be with you all throughout the rest of spring training as we lead up to opening day, 17 days away, which by the way, shout out Chris Sabo far and away, the best number 17 in franchise history. There you go. There's your, your moment about, you know, number 17 and all that great stuff. Didn't quite give it a whole segment. Like we had a chance so much to talk to, and there's so much more to get to on tomorrow's episode. So make sure that you join us. Why Steve? Because we're going to keep gathering up this information and and bringing you hot takey David Bell and breaking down all of the news and all of the rumors and keeping you locked on Reds every single day. Hot I think David Bell. David Bell. I think he announces it like uh, our opening day starter is uh, it's going to be uh, Frankie Montes.